I don't remember the actual impact. I do remember before, a golden summer day, warm, not hot, a slight breeze pushing my older sister and I along as we rode 10-speed bikes from our aunt and uncle's house on one side of their small Connecticut town to our grand's, grandparents' house on the other. A three-mile trip with an epic downhill stretch winding through the trees, perfect for racing. 12 going on 13, I was afraid of vampires and the wrath of teenage queen bees and the prospect that no boy would ever like me but I was not afraid of speed. I remember the wind calling to my sister, taunting her, listening to her taunt me in return, the rush of adrenaline as we changed the lead back and forth, weaving slightly. We were young and free and fast. And I remember after. My left side bore the brunt. Patches of skin on my face were scraped away, leaving a nasty pulp embed embedded with rocks sand, and that grit that accumulates on less traveled sections of road. I've heard that Levi's used to tumble their jean fabric in rock. I can, rem I can report that said fabric does not protect skin from actual rocks. Mine were torn away at my left hip and knee. I must have twisted in the air in an effort to break the fall with my dominant hand, since my right wrist was also torn up. None of this registered at the time. All I knew was I was bleeding badly. When I held up my right hand to catch the blood from my chin, the blood from my hand dripped onto the ground, leaving big red splotches. My Levi's were turning an unusual shade of maroon. There was an older couple there, occupants of a VW Beetle that almost hit me, and my sister asked them to take me to my mom at my grandmother's house. I would learn later there were ongoing debates at the time about offering legal protection to Good Samaritans due to some nasty lawsuits. The couple didn't want to take responsibility for what might, might happen to me if they put me in their car. I distinctly recall my sister pleading with them. Please, you have to help her. Can't you see she's going to die? The numb, thoughtless vacuum in my head suddenly filled with, oh my god, I'm going to die? So I said, I'm going to die? And my sister turned to me saying, no, you're fine. You're fine. Before turning back to the couple, please help us. She's going to die. And I repeated, I'm going to die. And she repeated, no, you're fine. On and on, until finally the couple agreed to take me. My sister and the woman climbed in the back. The man helped me into the front bucket seat before handing me a cotton handkerchief. This little white handkerchief, freshly pressed, saying, here, motioning toward my mouth. Within a minute, the hanky was soaked and blood began to pool in my hand and run through my fingers. I realized my mouth was a serious mess. Barely held in place by my braces, my teeth had been forced up and in and out, all wobbly. One tooth had punctured the skin and was poking out of a hole above my lip. I wasn't aware that head and face wounds bleed heavily, scary heavily. What I thought in my preteen post head hitting against a curb state was, I'm gonna die and I'm ruining their car. <laughs> I think this is when I began to cry. I vaguely recall my sister and the woman in the back seat were also crying. When we arrived at my grandmother's house, the man got out and told me to wait, that he would help me. The next thing I recall was my grandmother came out of the house and fell to the ground, wailing. Whatever it was she saw, to me, her reaction confirmed, this was bad. And then as the couple and the beetle hightailed it out of there, my mother brought me inside into the bathroom. Her first maternal instinct being to wash away all the blood, she hadn't thought about the existence of a huge mirror over the dual sink vanity, and I saw myself. My thinking rapidly shifted from, I'm gonna die, to, I remember this very clearly, I'm gonna be so ugly. <laughs> People will stare at me, little children will ask their mothers, what happened to her? <laughs> no boy will ever want to date me. Full disclosure, pre-accident, I was no beauty. 
I was super awkward with the aforementioned terrifically attractive silver braces, an ever-changing constellation of T-zone acne, eczema around my eyes caused by the clearasol that was supposed to clear the acne, and a dirty blonde shag haircut with bangs that resembled wings. <laughs> but until that moment in the bathroom, there'd been hope that I would grow out of all of that. Now, gazing into that mirror through my 12 going on 13 eyes, all hope was lost. As my mother began to run the water in the bathtub, I began to cry really hard, blubbering, and my sister came in saying, a mirror? Really, mom? Why would you bring her in here? In retrospect, I'm not sure what my mom was thinking with the running water. Was she going to bathe me? turn on the shower to wash away all the blood? Either option was likely impossible, as it would have been difficult to remove my clothing. Much of it was stuck to me, fibers ground into flesh. My sister demanded they call an ambulance. There was a brief discussion over whether this was a good idea or whether it would be better, faster maybe, to just drive ourselves. My mother abandoned her plans in the bathroom, wrapped me in a towel, called my dad to meet us, and loaded me into my grandmother's car. Arriving at the ER, I was whisked away into a curtained room where they asked if I ever lost consciousness. I couldn't be sure. Then a nurse appeared, brandishing an enormous needle. And I went ballistic, twisting and turning, screaming, I didn't want a shot because shots hurt. The argument the nurse gave that the pain I was in was far worse than a shot held no weight. But the two nurses they called in to hold me down did. And in the end, adding insult to injury, I was given two syringes of pain meds with those enormous needles in my ass. Enough to knock out a horse, my dad said. <laughs> From there, my memory gets murkier. For hours, my parents took turns by my side as the doctors debrided the skin on my face, shoulder, and arm, dug stones out of my left knee and hip. My mother declined an offer to save one of the bigger stones to make a ring out of it for her someday. <laughs> the hole in my knee was large enough to place a stack of quarters in it. The ones in my hip and wrist were nickel sized. The one over my lip would fit only a dime. Stitches, butterfly bandages, some kind of wet gauzy fabric were all used to hold me together. I thought I heard one of the doctors apologizing to my mother. They couldn't get all the fine dirt out. I would have scars, he explained, with discoloration. I don't remember anything of the next several hours, how I got back to my grandmother's or what I was wearing since they cut off my jeans, whether I cried, engaged in self-recrimination at my own stupidity and recklessness, thanked my sister for saving me, or simply slept through it all. The next thing I do remember is the parking lot at the orthodontist's office where my mother took me to have my teeth reseated. Maybe it was the pain meds or my subconscious heart at work, but I don't remember anything that happened inside, just the parking lot. Afterwards, when my mom told me it could have been so much worse, that I'd been lucky, if it hadn't been for the braces, I would have lost my front teeth on the left side, both top and bottom. I remember she held me as I cried, trying to allay my fears, explaining that the discoloration I'd heard the doctor mention was in relation to my knee, not my face. How a nurse had told her the doctor working on my face was the best. No one would ever know. This was little consolation at the time. However, she was right. Though I was left with noticeable discolored scars on my knee and hip, their size commensurate with the currency they could have held, and the faintest of tracks on the left side of my face when I sunburn, the scar over my lip, barely visible. By the time school started that fall, no one would know my face had been torn up. I was back to worrying about queen bees and boys. But then the nightmares began vivid dreams that recreated and amplified the details I'd forgotten. In my dreams, I felt the rush of air as I sped along faster than I'd ever gone. Too fast. My hands tightening over the brakes and the tires locking, my body arcing over the handlebars, the bike like a riderless horse veering right as my body went left. Slamming into the ground, I heard the scraping noise of gravel tearing my clothes, pulverizing my skin, the thud of hitting the curb like a sledgehammer and then the squealing of the brakes on the Volkswagen and the man swearing and my sister saying she's going to die. 
I could feel my mouth stretched open as the orthodontist worked. I could smell and taste blood. In my dreams, I remembered the indescribable burn of pain. For a long time, I was afraid to go to sleep. Invisible scars. In the end, I lost three of those teeth on the left side. Over the years, as they died and darkened, I've had root canals, all sorts of bleaching, and eventually they were replaced. To this day, I weep as soon as my ass hits the cool pleather of a dentist chair. I apologize and sit there making pleasant small talk with the staff as tears silently roll down my face. I seriously hate needles of any size. And though my parents encouraged me to get back on a bike as soon as possible, for which I am grateful, I've been left with a deep-seated fear of going downhill fast. I tried to overcome this fear several years ago, participating in a series of triathlons. It didn't work. <laughs> Regardless of how fast I rode up the hill, I was the absolute slowest going down, riding my back brake to a crawl. Not ideal for racing. It's been 40 years since that golden summer day in Connecticut, and I want to believe that I'm going to be fine. But each time I encounter a hill, the nightmares come screaming back, even though I'm wide awake. I'm flying, skidding, scraping, coming to a stop with a thud. I don't remember the actual impact, but I will never forget it. That was Anastasia Zedek.